As Mark Twain famously said, buy land, they're not making it anymore. I mean, at the very least, the quote is attributed to him, despite no concrete proof that he ever said it. But I mean, just throw Mark Twain after a quote and boom, you're done. But for the most part, that sentiment is true. Oh, while there are man-made islands, their total land mass is relatively small, and it's not really viable on a larger scale. So, as the world's population continues to increase, where are we going to put everyone? Or in the event that climate change or natural disasters renders the surface of the Earth uninhabitable, where will we all flee to? When faced with these questions, humanity tends to gaze upwards towards the sky, imagining all of the distant worlds that we could colonize. Perhaps instead, though, we should set our sights lower, below sea level. Over 70% of the Earth is covered in water, which means there's a whole lot of space that we just aren't using for anything. Most of that space hasn't been explored, which means there's a whole lot of uncharted real estate just waiting for a savvy entrepreneur to snatch it up and start building housing developments. There are already a number of houses and hotels available throughout the world that are referred to as being underwater, though that's just really usually a marketing gimmick. While the structures are built into the seafloor, only the bottom floor is underwater, with one or two more floors above water. They're an interesting novelty, but we're looking for something far more ambitious today. Would it actually be possible for humans to live in houses completely submerged underwater? Now, all of the technology required to live under the sea already exists for small-scale operations, and researchers have been doing it since the 1960s. The first attempts were conducted by famous French naval officer, filmmaker, and inventor Jacques Cousteau and his team. In total, they made three habitats. Conshelf 1, 2, and 3, short for Continental Shelf Station. Conshelf 1 was just a simple cylindrical design, 5 meters long and 2.5 meters in diameter. In 1962, two divers were sent into Conshelf 1 to live there for a week at a depth of 10 meters below the surface. The mission was a success, and so the team set their eyes on something bigger. The following year, Conshelf 2 was deployed, featuring two separate buildings. The main house, referred to as the Starfish because of its shape, was large enough to house a crew of five researchers. The Starfish was again installed 10 meters deep, while the Deep Sea Station 25 meters deep. Aquanauts lived inside the Starfish for a month, with the Deep Sea Station only being occupied for two weeks. Crews also spent five hours each day conducting research on marine life and building an underwater farm. Then in 1965, they built Conshelf 2. This time, the habitat was placed 100 meters below the surface of the water and housed six aquanauts for three weeks. They spent their days working outside the habitat on a mock oil well to test their physical capabilities when living at such depths. While Cousteau's habitats showed that humans are capable of existing underwater for extended periods of time, it also showed that people had difficulty existing in a world without sunlight. Many other habitats were inspired by these experiments, such as Helgeland, Sea Labs 1 and 2 and 3, Aquarius, and La Chobre Research Laboratory. Sea Lab 3, run by the US Navy, was the most famous of these projects. However, a diver died during the preparatory phases of the experiment due to human error. While the existing projects continued, this trend to send aquanauts to deeper habitats for longer periods of time reached its end. But because aquanauts and astronauts face many of the same problems, such as breathing in a place where humans can't breathe or existing on strict food rations, these underwater research facilities also provided inspiration for astronaut training. While there are still a handful of underwater habitats that remain in use for scientific research and exploration, the goal is more to understand the ocean than to understand ourselves. With all eyes on the stars, few people have tried researching just how long a person is able to live underwater. The exception to this is the Chalupa Research Laboratory, now known as Jules's Undersea Lodge. When it was done being used for research in the 1980s, the lab was converted into the United States' only undersea hotel. It's located in Key Largo, Florida, at a depth of 10 meters, and is home to the last few world records for living underwater in a fixed habitat. The most recent record was set by Dr. Joseph de Tourie on June the 11th of this very year, 2013, if you're watching in the future. On June the 11th of this year, 2023, after he spent 100 days living in the habitat. But it was never about the record for him. Turi also goes by Dr. Deep Sea, is a retired U.S. Navy veteran, doctor of biomedical engineering, and professor at the University of South Florida. He had two main goals in mind for his mission. His first goal was to study the effects that living at increased atmospheric pressure would have on people. Hyperbaric oxygen treatment has been shown to be helpful at treating brain trauma, Turi's main field of research, and he believed that it may have other benefits to human health as well. The other goal oh, was to provide research that could be beneficial for a potential trip to Mars, which would only last about 200 days. The only reason he chose to stay at Jules' undersea lodge for 100 days rather than 200 was because he couldn't get the funding to stay there longer. Though he was staying in the lodge alone, Dury wasn't completely isolated from the world. The lodge has Wi-Fi, which he used to conduct interviews with news outlets and speak to classrooms full of children. Other researchers would stop by as well, and there were frequent food deliveries as the lodge isn't big enough to store 100 days worth of food. Because this mission was completed so recently, it will probably be at least five more months before Dury publishes any findings, though he did 
did state that the preliminary findings have been rather optimistic. However, there are two notable effects of living underwater that can be conclusively stated from his trip already. The first is that Daturi shrunk about half an inch during his 100 days underwater. This shouldn't be a surprise, as it's already known that astronauts get taller. When living in microgravity, the vertebrae are able to expand because there isn't all that weight pulling them down. When living underwater with increased pressure, it only makes sense that the vertebrae would compact. The other notable difference was how much more limited Daturi's sensory input was while underwater. Like we said, he had Wi-Fi and was interacting with people all the time, and there was electrical lighting in the lodge, but it's not the same as genuine sunlight. Daturi explained how overwhelmed with visual stimulus he was when he was being driven home after getting out of the water, and he felt like it would be a week before he could handle driving safely. All right, so this is how far we've come to date in the quest to live underwater, and honestly, seems pretty far, doesn't it? So what's exactly stopping us from doing it? So, if we really wanted to, the technology exists to build small settlements underwater. All research thus far indicates that the human body can safely manage it. However, there are some limitations. The two most important limiting factors are size and depth. When living at sea level, the air exerts about 14.7 pounds of pressure per square inch on your body. This is called one atmospheric pressure, or ATM. For every 10 meters underwater that a person goes, they experience an additional ATM. So those visiting Jules's undersea lodge experience two ATMs, which isn't that much, whereas someone living in a habitat 100 meters underwater would experience 11 ATMs, which is considerably more. The human body can theoretically withstand 100 ATMs, so 11 ATMs is well within the limits, but there is a more important issue associated with that level of pressure. To start, the pressure inside a habitat has to be the same as outside the habitat to prevent the structure from imploding. So a person living 100 meters underwater would have a home with 11 ATMs of pressure inside. This amount of pressure compacts the gases in the air, making the air denser. However, when you try to breathe, your lungs will still require the same volume of air, even if the gases in the air are much denser. If you've ever been scuba diving, this is why your tank empties faster the deeper you go, even if your breathing rate remains the same. But if you've been scuba diving, particularly in deep water, you're probably aware of a serious danger that inhaling those compressed gases poses. Nitrogen narcosis. The exact mechanics of how and why nitrogen narcosis works aren't fully understood, but it disrupts the nervous system, causing mental impairment and altered consciousness. In short, you're getting drunk off of air. Now, this can be extremely dangerous for divers who may make stupid decisions and ignore safety protocol while in their drunken state. This is especially scary for divers since they can't talk, making it even more difficult than normal to try and talk sense into a drunk person. But even when in the safety of your own undersea habitat, this would prove dangerous as well. It's unlikely that a person experiencing nitrogen narcosis would do something as stupid as swim out of their habitat without scuba gear, but there are still plenty of extremely dangerous things that they could do inside their home like playing with matches. Oxygen under higher pressure is much more flammable, which can make even a single spark exceedingly dangerous at high enough pressures. People living in underwater habitats are generally restricted to either eating food cooked in a microwave or dehydrated meals that are cooked by adding hot water to them. A breathing gas known as Trimix, which replaces much of the nitrogen with helium instead, has been used to reduce the effects of nitrogen narcosis. However, it's still not a perfect solution, as some people can still feel the narcotic effects in varying degrees when submerged deep enough. All of this is to say that we probably want to restrict any underwater cities to 10 or 20 meters below the surface. And size is another important limiting factor, as the larger a habitat becomes, the more complex it needs to be, and the more difficult it is to deal with problems such as breathable air and adequate supplies of fresh water. However, Japan's Shimizu Corporation believes they have everything sorted out. Their proposed Ocean Spiral is an underwater city that would provide homes and workspaces for 4,000 people with enough space for 1,000 daily visitors. While this does make us wonder how many of those 4,000 people are just going to be working in open spiral or gift shops or as tour guides, it's still an innovative plan. More importantly, it's a plan that they believe they're ready to build now and could complete in five years. The Ocean Spiral would be a sphere half a kilometer in diameter, which would contain all of the homes and workspaces for its population. The spiral, in its name, refers to a long spiral structure that would descend four kilometers down to the ocean floor and would provide for most of the needs of the city. Water would be provided by reverse osmosis membrane desalination, using the high pressures present at the ocean depths to force water molecules through a thin membrane while leaving the salt behind. Clean renewable energy would be provided by generators that are driven by ocean thermal energy conversion, or OTEC, a process that takes advantage of the temperature difference between the icy waters of the deep and the warmer waters near the surface. While OTEC is an inefficient form of energy conversion, with only 7-10% of energy produced able to be extracted, there's a whole lot of oceans to work with, so Shimizu is confident that this would provide enough power to run the entire city. Food would of course be provided by large underwater farms of fish, crustaceans, and aquatic plants. Hopefully all the residents will 
world really enjoy eating nothing but salmon, crab, and seaweed for every meal. Shimizu has designs in place, which they have been refining for the past decade. However, there are no immediate plans to actually start construction. And well, the reason for that is very simple. Money. The proposed cost for Ocean Spiral is $28 billion. That is $28 billion to build a habitat for only 4,000 people, and a project of this magnitude is sure to go over budget as well. But at the end of the day, that's just far more money than anyone's willing to invest. While the reality is that underwater cities comprised of small-scale habitats are absolutely possible, nobody really cares, and they certainly don't care enough to invest the exorbitant amount of money that it would cost to finance these cities. Living underwater and living in space present many of the same challenges, and humanity as a whole has agreed that space is just a bit cooler. So, while the technology already exists for us to live underwater, if we really, really wanted to, the general consensus seems to be that we just don't want to. It's simply too expensive for no real benefit as life underwater is kind of sh**. Sure, it would seem cool at first to look out the window at a school of fish swimming by, but the novelty would quickly wear off. If you're truly intent on getting a taste of what life under the sea is like, you're better off just booking a night at Jules's Undersea Lodge. It costs over $1,000 per night, but each day does come with a complimentary dinner featuring a pizza with your choice of toppings delivered hot and fresh to your door by a scuba diver. You can order fancier and healthier meals delivered instead, but that costs an additional $175 per person. But if you do think this is the perfect romantic destination for you and your special guy or gal, you may do well to keep your Amora's urges in check. Local divers can absolutely peer through the windows of the Habitat's bedrooms, which do not come with curtains.